pay. All right, good morning everyone. Thank you for joining the Litchfield Special Risk and Colony Specialty Combined Under the Hood, a review of the traditional garage coverage form. We have with us Sandy Zimsek. Okay, I butchered that. Sandy is with us. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, without further ado, Sandy, um, you go ahead and take off. Thank you, Danielle. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad you could take the time out of your busy days to join us today. In this meeting, the plan is um, by the end of the meeting, we will have broken down the garage coverage form into three key parts, liability, garage keepers, and physical damage. Before we get into the details, we need to look at two key definitions. The first one, of course, is the definition of an auto. Um, the auto is any land motorized vehicle, trailer, or semi-trailer. And this can include motorcycles, RVs, trucks, campers, um, farm tractors, forklifts, anything of that nature. You need to make note that um, it does not mention that it needs to be licensed for road use. So just any land motorized vehicle fits the definition of an auto. And for the garage operations definition, it means the ownership, maintenance, or use of locations for garage business and that portion of the roads or other accesses that adjoin these locations. Garage operations includes the ownership, maintenance, or use of the autos indicated in section one of this coverage form as covered autos. And also note this last sentence, garage operations also include all operations necessary or incidental to the garage business. The reason I point this last sentence out is because it has become the catch-all for claimant attorneys. And that's why it's very important to understand what other businesses the insured may have ownership interest in and exclude it from, help us to exclude it from the garage policy. And I want to mention too, as Danielle said earlier, please feel free to um, ask questions at any time. So we start with garage liability. And garage liability is broken into two parts. Basically, it's um, other than auto, which is premises and operations liability, and auto, which is symbol driven, and we'll go through some of the symbols in just a bit. The rating basis um, for liability, it should include all owners, employees, and family members, including clerical, um, um, drivers, mechanics, everybody that's involved in the business. For dealer operations, it's based on rating units. And it's historically been that one rating unit is intended to be the equivalent of liability premium for a private passenger type vehicle on a personal auto policy. And the reason that is, is because for these used car dealers and even the franchise dealers, um, people are furnished vehicles for personal use. So rating units are determined based on the position, whether it's full-time or part-time, and whether or not um, it's furnished for personal use. So we need to make sure you'll see on garage applications that it asks all of those questions. So that's why it's important to make sure that section is completed. For service and repair operations, the same thing. It needs to include all owners and all employees, including clerical and drivers. And for service and repair, it's based on payroll, and the payroll is $5,200 per employee, and the standard is a minimum payroll of $7,800. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to get the information on all employees or persons involved in the business so that we can be sure we are charging the correct premium for the exposure. Okay, so like we said, like garage liability is broken into two parts, other than auto and auto, and the auto section is symbol driven. 
Now, probably the auto that you, or the symbol that you get requested the most is 21, which is any auto. And this makes that sense from an E&O standpoint, but from a carrier standpoint, the issue that we have is that the named insured is an individual. If they have a vehicle that's not involved in the business at all, but they give it to their 16-year-old to drive, under symbol 21, that vehicle is covered as well if the named insured is an individual or a partnership. So that's why some carriers um, will have some issues with symbol 21. What you will see carriers use is symbol 22, owned autos only. I am so sorry. Apologize for that. Typically what carriers will use is symbol 22, owned autos only, and symbol 29, non-owned autos used in your garage business. The reason you will see both of those on a dealer policy is because um, somebody may bring a vehicle in for a trade and they'll want to take it, the insured will want to take it for a test drive, so they need symbol 29 on the policy. 23 and 24, are also um, available on this coverage form, but both of them are rarely used because it's so limiting. If you has, have a used car dealer, owned private passenger autos only, it's, it's probably not a good idea to use that symbol because even if 99% of what they do is a private passenger type vehicle, they might get a motorcycle or a boat or um, some other type of vehicle in. Um, same thing with symbol 24, which is other than private passenger autos. It's too restricting, and so most carriers don't use it. Then there's symbol 27 for specifically described autos, and these are for the autos that are scheduled on the policy, whether it's a, a tow truck or a parts truck or um, just any type of service use vehicle used in the business. Symbol 28 is for hired autos only. For personal injury protection, it has its own symbol, as does uninsured motorists. Under liability, as um, do most co coverage forms, it has some supplementary payments, up to $200 for cost of bail bonds, reasonable expenses, incurred by the insured at our request, up to 250 a day for time off work, and it includes all court costs, not including attorney fees. And these supplementary payments do not reduce the limit of insurance. In the garage coverage form, there's also out-of-state coverage extensions. Because garage is basically auto-driven, um, we need to increase the liability limit to meet the compulsory or financial responsibility law of whatever state the loss occurs in, and also provide the minimum amounts and types of other coverages such as no fault. As an example, um, Florida is a personal injury protection state. Georgia is not, but if you've got a dealer that's really close to the Florida-Georgia line and they happen to drive into Florida and they're involved in an accident, even though PIP is not on the policy, it will apply. And then the exclusions under the garage liability, um, there, there, there are, of course, typical exclusions like expected or intended injury, contractual, workers' comp, defective products, products recall, war. And then there are some exclusions that I want to point out that are specific to garage. Under liability, care, custody, or control is excluded. The reason that it is is because this is intended to be covered elsewhere. If it's a vehicle or quote unquote auto that we're talking about, that's to be covered under garage keepers. If it's um, the rented property, that's intended to be covered either under fire legal or under the property section. Leased autos are also excluded. Um, this is why carriers ask that the rental leasing ops be covered elsewhere. This is, uh, let's say you have an RV dealer 
um, and they rent out the RVs. That rental portion of the business needs to be excluded from the garage policy, or it actually is excluded from the garage policy and should be covered elsewhere. Same thing with um, the rider or U-Haul trucks. There would be no coverage for that operation under the garage policy. There's also a racing exclusion, and it's important to note that it excludes coverage for autos while they're used in and while they're being prepared for any racing, stunt, et cetera, type activities, but it does not exclude resulting damage. So, for example, the cost to replace an engine in a race car can be very expensive. So that's why um, you'll find that a lot of carriers stray or stay away from those um, risks that are involved in racing activities, whether it's sponsorship of car, fixing the car, or actually racing the vehicle. Another exclusion um, specific to garage is watercraft or aircraft, except watercraft. Um, while ashore on premises where you conduct garage operations. So if you have a service repair shop that will occasionally take a boat in to work on the motor or even a body shop that will sometimes work on the hull of the boat, it's okay as long as it's on their premises um, while they're working on it. This means that you need to add the watercraft liability if any in-water exposure exists. There's also an exclusion called work you performed. and basically reads that the property damage results from any part of the work itself or from the parts, materials, or equipment used in connection with the work, it's excluded. This is basically um, a faulty work exclusion. We will not cover damage done to the part being worked on, but will cover resulting damage. Here's an example. If somebody comes in for an oil change and um, they, they don't put the plug back in, we won't cover the cost of the oil or the oil filter. We will, however, cost, cover the cost of the damage to the engine. So, so far on our outline of the garage coverage form, we have liability for other than auto and auto, and the auto portion is symbol driven. We have, and under the liability, we have supplementary payments and um, exclusions, some standard to, some, I'm sorry, some standard type exclusions and some that are specific to garage. So we will move on to garage keepers coverage. This is also triggered by a symbol. Symbol 30 is autos left with you for service repair, storage, or safekeeping. And at times you will need to add a symbol 32. There's a specific form and your carriers can guide you through this. The form is CA9954 and it can be defined to include coverage for watercraft, construction, or farm equipment. And this is only under garage keepers, okay, or physical damage, but we'll get to physical damage in a minute. And the reason that this, this symbol is used is anything that does not fit the definition of an auto, like a bicycle or a chainsaw or a cement mixer, um, or the escalator that they use to get the hay bales up to the top of the barn. Those don't, it's not a motorized land vehicle. It does have a motor, but it's not a land vehicle. So, you know, it's, it's best to make sure that those items are covered if the insured sells or works on that type, um, that type of equipment. For coverage options, we have comprehensive or specified cause of loss. Under specified cause of loss, the coverage includes fire, lightning, explosion, theft, mischief, or vandalism. So you can either have comprehensive or specified cause of loss and collision. For coverage basis options under garage keepers, the form itself reads on a legal liability basis. 
You can, however, um, add uh, pick it up to a direct primary basis, and that's actually shown on the deck page. And the way it reads on the deck page, it states that garage keepers is changed to apply without regard to legal liability and is primary. So what is covered under SCO ill is, as stated, a couple of the coverages are theft, mischief, and vandalism. And that's why um, writing SCOL on a primary basis may be acceptable to the insureds because their biggest concerns I found through the years is the theft, mischief, and vandalism, which they feel are outside of their control. Now, one of the things for trying to get the primary comprehensive coverage, carriers may not find this acceptable due to the cat exposure. So if you have a person's auto, or the insured has a person's auto in their shop, and it's sitting inside the fenced area, and a, a hailstorm or a tornado hits that area, that vehicle is covered, and carriers hesitate to become primary on customers' autos. So just kind of keep that in mind. You may be able to sell the specified cause of loss on a primary basis to your insureds because it includes theft, mis mischief, or vandalism. So the exclusions specific to garage keepers are theft or conversion caused by an insured or their employee, defective parts or materials, and again, faulty work. So now the outline of the garage coverage form includes liability and garage keepers, and we will move on to physical damage. Physical damage coverage is also triggered by a symbol. This includes physical damage for the specifically described autos, which is symbol 27. Um, symbol 31 is for the dealer's auto, and symbol 32 again can be in defined to include coverage for water, craft, or construction, um, or farm equipment that does not fit the definition of an auto. For the coverage options, it's still comprehensive or specified cause of loss and collision. Um, I need to point out that for specified cause of loss, it's a bit broader on the physical damage side because um, it also includes windstorm, hail, or earthquake, as well as flood, and the sinking, burning, collision, or derailment of any conveyance transporting the covered auto. So specified cause of loss under physical damage is a bit broader. Under the deductibles um, for physical damage, um, most policies include a per vehicle and a maximum deductible, and most, um, most carriers offer up to five times the per vehicle deductible as the maximum deductible. Typically, there are separate wind hail flood deductibles, and you need to watch because these may not, for those perils of wind hail and flood, it may not include a maximum deductible. Under the physical damage coverage, there's also some typical auto type exclusions. Uh, excludes autos leased and rented to others, um, autos used in racing, the typical tapes, records, discs, or similar electronic devices, equipment not permanently installed, um, normal exclusions of wear and tear, freezing, mechanical or electrical breakdown, and damage to tires. Those exclusions that are specific to garage would be false pretense. This is where um, people may come in to test drive and they give a fake ID or they somehow get the key away from the salesperson and steal the vehicle. It's excluded, but it can be purchased. Expected profit is also excluded. The intent is to indemnify for monies spent not to reimburse the insured for any expected profit. New locations, if not reported within 35, I'm sorry, 45 days are also excused, excluded. 
There is a temporary location limit on the deck page, but it usually matches the per vehicle limit, is so is very low. Collision coverage, if it's outside the stated radius, there is um, excluded. And the form limits to 50 mile radius. Most ENS carriers increase to 300 or more with the option to buy that radius up. Okay, physical damage coverage also has some limitations that you need to be aware of. The garage declaration stipulates limits for in transit and temporary locations. As well, the most probably the most important one is the 100% coinsurance clause. Um, wait, I need, I'm sorry, I need to back up to the in transit and temporary locations. Um, both of these typically match the per vehicle limit. If you have a risk that will hold off-site auctions a few times a year, the temp locations limits should be increased. So you'll need to be aware of that. Then we'll move on to the 100% coinsurance clause. Um, coinsurance is typically figured as did over should times the loss minus the deductible. So in this example, um, A to Z Auto Sales has had their lot limit listed as 50,000 for the last five years. I understand, you know, I feel for you guys because I know it's tough when you're out there talking to these small car lots. They don't want to increase the limit because they don't want to pay the increased premium. But let's say there's a tornado that destroys all of the vehicles on their lot. At the time of the loss, they had 15 vehicles on the lot with a total invested value of 75,000. They also have a wind tail flood deductible of 1000 per auto because they're in Texas. So if you, um, 50,000 divided by 75,000 times the loss limit of 75,000 equals 50,000. So right there up front, there's a reduction. Then you take the deductible off and the amount that will be paid on this lot is, loss is 35,000. So basically, because they were not insured to value, the policy holder will be out of pocket 40,000 instead of the 15,000 for the applicable deductibles. And um, I'm sure every once in a while you guys have run into this, an insured does not like it when we don't pay everything that they've invested in these autos. So the outline of the garage coverage form. Um, and this was just a really quick webinar, but I'm hoping that you guys have a better understanding of the garage coverage form and how it, how it works. Um, so this completes our outline of the traditional garage coverage form. Um, I hope this has cleared up any confusion you may have had and simplifies the product for you. To review, the garage coverage form is broken into three distinct areas. Liability, which includes premises and operations and auto liability coverage. Supplementary payments, and you need to pay attention to the exclusions. The second piece is garage keepers, which is for the um, customer's autos in the insured's care custody or control and it can be written on a legal liability or direct primary basis. And then it's physical damage, which provides coverage for owned autos held for sale and scheduled autos. It can also covers autos that are held on consignment. So Danielle, did you get any questions from the folks? Um, not yet. I know that um, Jorge, if he's still on, he had a question yesterday that I couldn't answer. So I'm, I'm going to see if I can um, find him here and unmute him. Let me scroll down. Jorge, can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. Um, you had some questions yesterday, so now would be a, a great time to um, ask Sandy. Okay, um, Sandy, uh, 
thank you very much for the information. Yeah, the question I asked the nail yesterday was uh, I, I did have a case where the uh, this was a small dealership and the owner had a concern for liability that she may uh, have um, kind of bounced back to her in case one of the uh, she also uh, I need to backtrack she rents she sells used cars but she also rents them and obviously she requires the known owned uh, if people don't have their own insurance but she's concerned that if one of those people default on their insurance the liability to a third party might come back to her as the uh, uh, obviously the owner that that's uh, leasing or or uh, renting the vehicle so we were never never able to find any coverage and i was wondering whether you've heard anything uh that might be a solution for that situation. now is is this leasing as a form of payment for the auto or is no. it a short-term rental it's a short-term rental if it's a short-term rental it is specifically excluded under the policy under the garage policy what she needs to do is get um a contingent lease policy and yeah. it's it's you know the, the the premium isn't the same as if all the autos were scheduled but it will pick up on a contingent basis if um, the person leasing the vehicle lets their insurance lapse and is involved in a loss. So she needs that contingent lease auto policy. Okay. Do you guys do that or is that another carrier? That isn't something that we offer right now. Carrie, do you know of anybody that's offering that? I do not. Susan, do we have any carrier okay. that does that? Um, I believe that that's something that we can offer through brokerage with Hilda. Okay. Or hey, so, I'll have uh, Hilda give you a ring this afternoon. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I did have a second question. That if you could back up to the last, um, the last, the slide before the questions slide. And uh, yeah, I, I did. I was kind of a uh, little bit um, confused with the difference between legal liability and direct primary. I'm, I'm new to the industry, so some of the terms kind of confuse me. I don't know if you could uh, perhaps just go with that one more time. Absolutely, Jorge. I would love to. Um, for garage keepers, which is coverage for the customer's autos in our insured's care, custody, or control, in order for this coverage to apply, our insured has to be legally liable for the damage. So if they park it on the street and somebody comes and bashes out the windows, um, then, then um, they are considered legally liable because they've done nothing to protect that vehicle. But if they have it behind a fence and it's a well-lit lot, um, whether they have cameras or not or alarms or not if they if they've done something to protect that vehicle and some kids come by and I don't know throw things over the fence that damage the cars in any way the insureds are typically not deemed le legally liable okay so there would be no coverage under garage keepers now um, you have to think of it this way too for garage keepers. If an in, once an insured has the key to that vehicle, that vehicle is considered in their care, custody, or control. So on a direct primary basis, it doesn't matter if they can be held legally liable or not, there's coverage. So for wind, hail, and flood, there's coverage under their policies for their customers' vehicles. Okay, let me oh. give you another example. This is actually a loss that we had. It's an RV repair place and the customer brought their RV in and um, they went inside and signed the paperwork, explained you know, that it wasn't running well, it was kind of missing, and they gave, signed the paperwork and gave the insured the key and at that time the RV was parked out front. The insured had not touched that vehicle yet. But the, when the insured went out about a half hour later to move the vehicle, um, they discovered that it was on fire and, and, and they couldn't put it out so it burnt to the ground. 
because they had direct primary coverage that was covered under garage keepers. And the funny thing is, is that insured was so upset that we paid that loss because they didn't feel it was their fault. And it wasn't, but because of direct primary coverage, it was covered because that vehicle was in their care, custody, or control the minute they took those keys. Does that make sense? Yep, to completely. Thank you very much. I, I understand it now. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Anything else? Sure, no problem. Sandy, this is Susan. I get a lot of questions from customers about how to coverage, how to cover a risk where um, they are just doing mobile work on vehicles. Mm -hmm. Could you explain a little bit how that covers when there's no premise for the liability or for the garage keepers, how it should be covered? Absolutely. There is no language in the garage coverage form, either under liability or garage keepers, that is location specific. Okay. So we ask to put on the policy the location that they operate out of. And we also can put garage keepers under that, that location. So it looks kind of on the deck page, it looks as if we're limiting coverage to that location, but we're not because there's no policy language for liability or garage keepers that limits it to that location. Okay. Under physical damage, there is specific wording that limits it to that location. So mobile ops can are, are covered, and it's basically with whatever the coverage territory on the form, which is the U.S., Canada, Puerto Rico. Okay. Sandy, we, we also get questions on uh, tow truck operations. Mm-hmm. So there is a limit on how many tow trucks they can have, correct? Well, for us, yes. Um, we have found that when it, we get into the fleet tow truck operations, um, having written auto for so many years, and we wrote a lot of the fleet tow risks, and fleet being five tow vehicles or more, um, that did not perform as well as the non-fleet. And as you know, the industry is struggling right now. Any carrier that offers auto um, over the last three or four years has struggled trying to get that line of business to make money. Um, it blew up, I believe, starting in, oh goodness, it seems like it was 2012, 2011. Um, we exited standalone auto in 2013 um, because the performance was so poor. But we do offer it as a companion on our garage policies. And um, so if you have a tow risk, we have to write the garage liability and garage keepers. And for non-fleet risks, we'll pick up the autos and the on-hook coverages as well. But for a limited number of units, right? Right, four or less. Four or less, okay. Anything else Susan, that comes up often in, in the questions we get when people call in? I don't think so. I think Sandy's covered everything that uh, we get questions on. Fantastic. If, if, uh, if we don't have any questions from, from the group, um, I'd like to thank, thank you, Sandy, so much for doing this for us. It, it was very informative and educational. And uh, now I expect all these garage applications to come into Litchfield <laughs> from everybody on the phone. <laughs> and uh, I we, agree. we thank you very much. Um, we appreciate your time this morning. And thank you, everyone, for participating and joining us on this call. And all our garage applications are online. Oh, yes, they are on the Litchfield website. Go to the Applications tab, then go to the PNC box. Then go to Colony Garage, and all the apps are there, including the supplementals. Very easy to find and fill out. Great point, Susan. Thanks again, everyone. Okay. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.